Tom Campbell here. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you and enjoy the video. Good afternoon, Tom. Today I'd like our discussion to be on the fear of death. This is a question that often comes up. This is something that every age group considers at one time or another. And sometimes this fear of death is very serious for some. So if we can approach this in a general way to help those people, how would you begin to address this particular issue? All right. Um, fear of death is one of the biggies. You know, it's one of the major fears that, that people have. But it's not necessarily a simple fear. There's some, there's various kinds of things that lead to what we, we uh, might call the fear of death. One is the fear of the unknown. Sometimes one's fear of death is a fear of just not knowing what's going to happen, if anything. Sometimes it's a fear of born out of uh, regrets that they did some things they wish they hadn't have done or they made choices that they wish they hadn't have made. And now they're in a situation of feeling like they'll never be able to set that straight. You know, they're going to die soon. Uh, for whatever the reason, they may not be old, they may just be, you know, had been in an accident or something, but um, they feel like they have a lot of unfinished business. You know, it could be that sort of thing, which then makes them afraid of dying. Uh, it could be religious. Some people who are, who are very religious will have a fear of death if they feel like there's things they did that were not good things that were more hell quality than heaven quality. And, you know, maybe uh, they're, they're unsure about how that's going to work out. And there's a fear of, of then, what, hell and damnation, if you will, not making the grade. Um, so there's all kinds of things that can add up, you know, to become the fear of death. I think the first one I mentioned, the, the fear of the unknown, is probably one of the probably one of the big ones, you know, because that would, you know, the religious fear of heaven and hell is really a subset of being afraid of the unknown. <clears throat> so how do we approach people who are paralyzed? by their fear. That's kind of a more general topic, but we'll use the fear of death kind of as a, as a, as a good example. Sometimes people get tied up in their fears and it's called panic attacks, where the fear just becomes overwhelming. You know, they have this fear all the time, but it bubbles up in certain circumstances. It may help it bubble up and when it bubbles up, it overwhelms the person. And that being overwhelmed by, by their fear is often what we call panic attacks. Um, sometimes that's, uh, you know, crying jags where people just, you know, feel the need to, to cry for a long time and they may not even know why. That's kind of a similar thing. That's fears building up to the point where they are difficult to manage, where they're overwhelming. So crying is a, is a, is a fear of being overwhelmed by feelings, by problems, by issues, by choices. So when people have that level of fear, it's not going to be very helpful to go in and have an intellectual discussion with them about how they ought to let that fear go and how you know they need to accept the fact that 
the past is past or the future will be whatever it is and to not be fearful and this sort of thing. You can have that intellectual discussion, but that will be of little value. Matter of fact, it will just convince that person that you don't understand. You're, you're, you don't have anything really to offer them because intellectual advice isn't something they can use to help fix an emotional problem. Okay, so the, the problem, fear, fear is not rational. So you try to approach someone who's not rational with a rational argument and it just doesn't get you very far. So the first step is to realize talking them out of it or explaining to them why they shouldn't be afraid is counterproductive mostly. Not only not helpful, but counterproductive. So you're going to have to use a more indirect approach with these people because intellectually, they may be perfectly aware that their fears are silly or that their fears, you know, are, are things totally beyond their ability to do anything about. So, you know, why, why bother with them? Why let them bother you so much if it's completely beyond your ability to do anything about it? Which is rational. You don't worry about things that you have no control over. Those things just happen or they don't. Being fearful of them then is non-productive. So you see, that's the rational viewpoint. Oh, you're being non-productive. Why don't you just let it go? <laughs> of course, people can't do that. That's not something they can do. So fear being irrational cannot be addressed by rational discussion or rational argument. Generally makes it worse. All right, so what can we do then? I would suggest that the first way to approach someone who's full of fear is with a a consciousness to consciousness communication. Okay, that is, you use your intention to connect with that person. And when you connect with that person, you try to soothe them. You try to tell them everything's going to be all right. Well, helping somebody who is being overwhelmed by fear, you approach it in a similar way. Not directly, not with lectures, not with explanations but with caring, with holding, with comfort, with, by bringing up positive things, things that are distracting, if you will. Because part of the problem with being overwhelmed by fear is that it's, it's, a, it's a negative cycle that keeps getting worse and worse. If you have a fear, maybe even a small fear, and that fear is a worry, just worrying about it, just having that fear will create more fears. The more you think about that fear, the more fears will come up. The more fears that come up makes you more worried, which makes even more fears come up. And that just is a cycle that goes around and around and spirals downward to where you're overwhelmed with fears. So you have to help people break out of that cycle because that cycle of being overwhelmed by your fear often then gener generates a cycle of depression. People who are overwhelmed by their fears tend to get depressed, become dysfunctional. They're not focused at work. They're not focused at home. They're not focused on the things they need to do. They're preoccupied with their fears. So it becomes something that gets in the way of the rest of their life. So how do you unwind that downward spiral of fear? Well, you unwind it with positiveness. That spiral of fear is really a spiral of negativity. Oh, this is awful. And when you're in one of those moods where you're looking at what's awful, you can see all kinds of things that are awful. And the more you spend looking at awful things, the more awful things you'll see. And then it ends up being overwhelming and you feel inadequate. Maybe you feel inadequate with life, and that's your problem. But if you feel inadequate with life and you dwell on that inadequacy, it just makes you feel more and more inadequate. You see, it's the same thing. and You can spiral downward into a, a fear of not being adequate, a fear of not being lovable, not being good enough. All those things can pull you down. Or fear of the unknown, the fear of death, the fear of 
having made mistakes that you'll never be able to fix. You see, rather than letting things go and going on with your life, you're stuck in the past. So these things are all things where we, the more you think of it, the more negative you are, the easier it is to find more negativity to think of, and then we get stuck with it. So we need to back people out with positive things. In the beginning, it's just sometimes enough just to sit down with them and be with them. You know, just be present with somebody. Maybe hold their hand or just be there. You know, that's some comfort, just to have somebody else there, even though you don't say anything. That can be helpful. Now, on a mind to mind level, you can be positive. You can give them positive feelings. You can give them feelings that they are worthy, they are okay, that death isn't going to be you know, a horrible thing, that their consciousness will continue, and then they will have another opportunity to make good choices, and another one after that, and everything's going to be okay. You know, it's, uh, it's just a part of life is ending that life. It's just a part of nature. It's a natural thing. They're not the first person to die. There's been billions of people who have died and all the life goes on without them and things continue and that's the way it will be when they die too. So being positive, that's the key. So go ahead, Donna. I, I think the positive um, positivity uh, treatment in general is a, is a very good thing. Um, because if negativity works in a downward spiral, well, positivity will work in an upward spiral. That you, is will not, true. you will start to latch on to all other things in your life that were wonderful and positive. But what if you, something more deep? Now, in a general way, I think that could work for a lot of people. That would be helpful. What if the, the fears were a little more environmental perhaps what someone witnessed perhaps how relatives or parents felt something more and you know when you when you see things um, in people that you love you tend to trust in that and you tend to uh, grasp onto that and and uh, believe it yourself so how would, in that sense, would someone um, let go of that? That seems to be a little more difficult. I, I love the positivity approach, reversing all of that negative downward spiral, but in the sense of a early memory, um, how everyone in in the family or in the community felt about death, uh, that sort of sense. How could that start to unravel? Okay. Well, it's going to unravel in the same way in that it's just that the way you come to positivity there is a little different. Let's say you have someone who uh, at a young age watched their mother die and the mother was terribly frightened, was terrified terrified of death and the child picks that up and then the child you know we get a lot of fears from our parents you know the parents are afraid of water you know and they never learned how to swim and the children tend to be afraid of water too we we tend to pick up a lot of fears from our parents because after all the parents are almost godlike in their power and in their knowledge and if they're frightened then it must be really bad you know that's the way young children think so you do the same sort of thing. You would come to such a person in this mind-to-mind -mind, uh, connection, and I'll, a little later I'll explain just how one produces this mind-to-mind -mind connection so that uh, people can go actually use this and apply it. But you would go to such a person, and you would, you would start with the same kind of soothing and positiveness until you got a little rapport going, and then you would if you particularly, let's say you knew about them and their mother, then you would, you would talk to them about their mother. Oh, remember your mother. She was very, very frightened. But as it turns out, it worked very well for her. Your mother's doing very well. She made that transition. And here, let me show you a little kind of video of that transition. 
of your mother. Now, maybe that's something I could do that maybe others wouldn't be able to do quite so well. But, you know, let's talk about your mother some and, and explain to them how it was positive. How, oh, yes, she was very, very frightened because she was afraid of the unknown and she wasn't sure. But here's what happened to her. You know, she found herself awake in this other reality, you know, and then she met some relatives who had already passed away. She did this. She did that. She looked around and saw what kind of life that she wanted to, wanted to live next time and the things she wanted to learn, and off she went. And, you know, right now, she's, you know, in, a, in another life. She's doing other things as other people, still making choices, still growing up, still vital. And that's what happened to mom. So though she was frightened of the unknown, or even just frightened of death, for whatever her reason, Here's what happened to her. And the person may ask you, well, how do you know? You know, to get confirmation as you're just not making that up. And you'll have to tell her, says, well, I've, you know, I've, I've watched that happen. I understand how that works. That's the nature of our reality. Our reality works that way. It's, um, you know, it's just the way we are. We're consciousness. We're not bodies. We're consciousness. And the body dies, but the consciousness does not. We move on. So you'd say those things, and those will be hopeful words to this person. And if you say it in a way with kindness, not in a lecture, not in you're trying to convince them or trying to sell them on anything, but just introduce it as an idea. You see, no hard sell here. No sell at all, actually. You're just introducing this as a concept of the way it is. And you could even start out with, you know, Here's what a whole lot of people believe. A whole lot of people believe that, you know, you could do it that way. And then after you've gotten a rapport and, the, and you and that person are having a good conversation and you can say, well, you know, I kind of believe that too. You see, which then would give them another little positive thing. So you have to approach each individual as an individual. You see, if you know somebody who is who's afraid of death and you know that their mother was as well, well, then that's an angle to approach it with. You know, approach it with mom. Go back and take that spot that where that fear originated and defuse the fear. Turn it from something negative to something positive. And even if you just leave the concept, it's such an attractive concept. It's such a positive concept that they'll want to reach out and grab hold of that. All you have to do is not push it at them not lecture them, just float it out there and, uh, you know, have a discussion about it. Say, well, mm -hmm. ask them, what do you think? And then they'll tell you, well, I don't know. Yeah, maybe, but I'm not so sure. And then you could, you could talk a little bit more about it. So as long as you stay positive and you're somebody who cares about them, you're not somebody who's trying to talk them into things, anything or out of anything. You're not telling them they're wrong and they need to stop being this way or stop being so fearful or fearful is a bad thing. All of that would be counterproductive. You're just having a conversation and you're being very positive and you leave them with the idea that you like them and you think they're really a, a wonderful person and you know they're going to go on and do more wonderful things, you know, and so on. They're going to learn and grow. So you just stay positive. No pressure. No end point. You speak of this from your experience in consciousness exploration, but and your viewpoint of us as, as consciousness. This is big picture. This is a way to look at it in a big picture. Mm -hmm. um, you have that experience and you have witnessed a lot of these transitions. However, to grasp the concept simply that we are consciousness and that we move on is something that anyone can grasp. You don't need to uh, believe in a, certain, in a certain thing. You can simply look at it and understand from a being level that we go on and that can perhaps simplify mm -hmm. it right. or, or at least that going on is a possibility right that's all really that you have to get across 
not not convince them of anything in particular, but just that going on is a possibility. And as you talk with them, and, and this chatting with them should not be just a one-time thing. Like, I'm just going to do this once and I'm done. This should be something you're going to have to do again and again and again. You have to revisit it. And as you build up rapport with this person, you build credibility. And you're, you're a very nice, kind, and positive person. And you seem to care about them, love them. And your credibility and believability starts going up, you see. And it just works out that way, you know. So it's not just a single shot. Otherwise, the person would say, yeah, well, I don't know. But after the third or fourth or fifth or tenth conversation that you have, your credibility is real good because you're one of the few people that are not trying to talk them into anything. You're one of the few people that's not trying to manipulate them to be the way, you know, that person thinks they should be. You're not trying to tell them that they're wrong or that, you know, the fear that they have is wrong or anything else. You're just pleasant, positive, caring. And people like that are easy to change your mind, you know, it, it's the negativity that, that uh, pushes you away. You know, it's that negativity that makes you go like that. But when you run into people who are positive, it's more an embrace. So it, yeah, it will take a little time. It's not a one off kind of thing. You'll have to work it, at it. But to deal with people's fears and attitudes and feelings, these things are all mostly non rational. If they're fear-based, they are non-rational. If they're belief-based, they're non-rational. If they're ego-based, they're non-rational because ego and fear, I mean, ego and, and beliefs are all products of fear. Fear is not rational. So to approach these people, you need to first have an intent of what it is you want to do. In your own mind, you have to get yourself straight that you're not talking them into out of anything. You're not there to manipulate them. You're there just to give them some peace and some love and some caring and then open up some possibilities that they hadn't thought about before. You see, and you're not saying that this is what you should believe. Listen to me, you know, your consciousness and you're going to go on. That will push them the opposite direction because now you're a salesman. Everybody knows when the salesman starts pushing, you go the other way. Because the salesman's got something to sell, but you don't have anything to sell. You're just a nice person that makes them feel good because you're so positive. And if you keep it at that, it's always about them, never about you. Never about you trying to make them be or manipulate or think anything in particular. It's just being positive and opening up some possibilities to let them think about it at their own speed in their own time. And then another day later, you visit them again. And again, no pushing, no forcing, no, you're not even goal oriented other than that you're giving them an opportunity for them to change themselves as far as to embrace the positive rather than embrace the negative. You're just giving them opportunities. So all you need is an intent. And the best way to do that, I guess one of the easiest ways to do that is to one, get in a good meditation state. Well, if you're not a meditator, that means you have to go learn meditate. Well, that's not necessarily, you know, something that you have to do. Just put yourself in a calm state where your mind is not doing anything else other than this communication. So if you're a meditator, well, that's a good meditation state. If you're not a meditator, that's just sit quietly and, and put all of yourself, 100% of yourself into this communication, into being positive. And how you're positive depends on the individual. Like I say, it may be about talking about the mother. Don't avoid the subject. If that's, you think, the cause, then talk about that and turn it into something positive. And don't deny what they feel about it. They, they felt that it must be horrible because mom was giving them the message it was horrible. And you can, yes, of course. Yeah, I remember that. Mom was really, really wound up there. But 
you know, she found out that it wasn't horrible at all. You're going to find that out too. Yeah. Because, you know, if you're dying, you know, death is going to happen. We're all going to find that out. You know, so just keep it positive and deal with what you think is specific. If it's somebody having a panic attack, you might want to treat that differently. You might talk to them about having confidence. See, a lot of that is lack of confidence, feeling inadequate, the panic attack. I can't handle this. What if I do it wrong? Oh, no. You know, what if I mess up? What if I make a fool of myself? What if I'm unworthy and just can't do it? At the end, I'll try as hard as I am and I fail. What if that happens? And then that becomes this downward spiral, and then pretty soon it just gets so much that panic attack. They can't do anything. You see, so with that, you wouldn't be talking about death as much as you'd be talking about adequacy, confidence. You're okay. You're fine. You're really a wonderful person. So you've got a lot, you know, you've got a lot to offer and a lot to give. And, you know, things will work out all right. They've worked out all right so far. You see, and you, you, and if they have a particular thing that causes their panic, atta panic attacks, then that's the particular thing you work at, trying to make that thing go from scary to positive. So that's why I say it's different for every individual. You kind of have to know where they're coming from. What's the, what are the key things that are causing them the problem? Where's the key fears coming from? And then turn that into something positive. And you have to do it, I don't know, every day, maybe for two or three weeks, maybe a month. You just have to keep being positive with them. Again, it's got to be about them, not about, oh, I'm spending all this time trying to get grandma to settle down. I sure hope she settles down. You see, now it's all about you. It's about you getting grandma to settle down. This is a manipulation to fix grandma. If you come at it from that viewpoint, it won't work very well. It may even backfire. Now, when you say every day, um, you can use, you could possibly not be able to visit someone every day. However, you can use the consciousness to consciousness method that you were speaking about and sure. accomplish it that way. Yeah, you don't, when I said every day, I don't mean go to see them. If you try this physically, it won't work very well because they'll think you're just being patronizing. Oh, cheer up. You're a wonderful person. And they're going, yeah, right, right. Uh -huh. I'm a wonderful person. Now they think that just makes them feel worse about themselves because they know you're trying to talk them out of it by telling them that. And you don't really mean it. You're just saying that to, to see if you can't make them feel better. But you see, it, it doesn't work. When you talk to somebody, conscious to consciousness, you get past the defensiveness. You get past the ego. You get past all of that stuff that's in their intellect. Their intellect just knows they're defective or they're having a problem or they're, you know, something terrible happened when they die. And you can't get past that because that intellect is sitting right out there judging and analyzing everything you say. And that intellect is convinced that it's horrible. There's no, you know, so that's a barrier to you. So that's why the physical thing has problems. It's really hard to deal with that from a physical to physical viewpoint. But when you talk to them consciousness to consciousness, you slip by all of that and you get directly into the core of their being. You're talking to them at the being level. You're talking to them at their core of their consciousness. So in that case, as long as you're not pushy, or as long as you're not manipulating, as long as you are credible and you start softly and work it up, you know, you, on the first day, you know, you don't tell them everything you can think of to say, you know, and throw it all out there because then that's a red flag that you're trying to manipulate them. And it's probably true. You probably are trying to manipulate them and you're in a hurry. It's just a connection with people, soothing them getting to know them on a conscious to conscious basis, getting connected to them, telling them about you. Share, it's not just a one way street. You know, you can talk to them, they can talk to you and you have a, a connection there. So the connection has to be real, not like I'm going to fix you. 
I'm going to help you get over panic attacks, or I'm going to help you with the, you know, with the, with the the dying thing. It's not like that. You have to, just like if you were going to grandma or somebody else, and just first become a friend, somebody who cares about them, just enough to sit and be with them. Maybe not more than that. And next time, maybe you, you'll talk a little. You see what I mean? You build up that that rapport, just like you would if you were making friends with someone, but you do it in a non-physical level. And yes, you will always make that connection. If you have the intent to make the connection, you will make that connection. And the other person may or may not be aware of you making that connection. They may or may not hear your words, but they'll get the message just the same. They'll get the feeling, they'll get the content even if they don't ever hear the words. And the way you check that is after doing this for a week or so, go around that person and see if you can tell that their moods change some. And I'll give it a, you know, if you do this conscientiously, I'll, as I've described it, I give it a very high probability that you'll find they're more positive now. Their mood has changed. And if you ask them, well, you're more cheery now today. What happened? What cheered you up? And they may not know. They may not be able to tell you. They just feel better. They're not so negative. They're more positive. So you see, you will make that connection. They will get the message as long as the message is coming from your caring, your love, not from a goal that you're going to make, a thing, a change you're going to make. If, if it's that, if it's goal-oriented, if it's fixing grandma or fixing Aunt Susie who has panic attacks, it's not going to work very well because you'll start out saying the wrong things in the wrong way. You'll have the wrong attitude and it just won't work. The attitude has to be one of giving and caring. And that giving and caring attitude has to be authentic. It can't be something you pretend to be giving and caring so you can trick Aunt Susie and grandma into, into doing what you want them to do. It can't be tricky. It has to be authentic. You have to really care. And if you do, and you spend, and you don't spend a lot of time on it, that, that conversation may take 10 minutes out of your time. Just sit quietly someplace where you're not going to be interrupted, where you have 10 minutes. Maybe before you fall asleep at night. Yeah, maybe uh, if you wake up in the middle of the night, do that before you fall back asleep again. Or maybe first thing in the morning. Or maybe when you take a coffee break and you're, and you're by yourself, or maybe you're just walking between your office and the office on the other side of the building you work in, and it's gonna take you five or 10 minutes to walk from one to the other. You can do it while you're walking. You can pull 10 minutes out of a day someplace. And every day, twice a day even, now you can't do it like every 10 minutes, that'd be too much. Now you're, you're, you're pushing, you're pushing too hard and people's alarm bells will go off. I can't trust this person, they're pushing at me, they're trying to get me to do something. So you can do this even if you're not a good meditator because the more you focus and get into the connection, the more your mind will settle down all by itself and just the act of doing it will create a meditation for you. So anybody can do it. Anybody can do it, but it needs to be done for positive reasons that are caring. If you try to apply the same technique to convince your boss that they need to give you a raise or to, you know, to manipulate somebody to do what you want, whether it's your children or your boss or you know, your mother-in-law, if you use this then, it will probably backfire because those people will become aware that you're manipulating them. Consciousness to consciousness doesn't have secrets. Everything comes through. Your attitude comes through. Your feelings come through. It's not like verbally when you talk face to face. You can get good at pretending to be happy and smiley when you're really seething inside. Well, conscious to conscious are not like that. If you're seething inside, they'll know it. They'll get it too. It's both ways that communication travels. And again, you set that that link up just with your intention. 
So if your intention is not honorable, if you're trying to trick your boss into giving you a raise, then your boss will know that you're being tricky and trying to manipulate him. And he'll probably think less of you for it. He may not know that intellectually, but he'll feel it because you are being tricky and trying to manipulate him. So you use it for negative things, it will probably bite you. Eventually, it almost certainly will bite you, even if you get away with it sometimes. Well, our consciousness is uh, real. That's our essence. And uh, the idea that we are all connected, there is one consciousness that we are a part of, is something that people can often understand. And therefore, the communication this way is something that they can understand, that they can do, that simply um, they simply have this right as consciousness, they have this ability rather as consciousness to do this. So you don't need mm -hmm. any special techniques, but you do need a sincerity, from what I gather that you're saying, a sincerity and a clear intent to help rather than accomplish something that you wish to accomplish, at least uh, not right. too quickly. Right. Don't take it on as a job mm. with an end result. Take it on as a building a relationship, a positive relationship with somebody you care about. Yeah, that's the that's the attitude. Well, I think that's a lovely way to wrap up this interview. And I think there's a lot of very helpful things in there that people can use to lessen their fear of death or uh, anything. Yes, well, you know, it works for, like you say, for anything. What if there is a person that you had an argument with and now you're so, you know, the both of you are angry and it's hard to go make up or maybe somebody that, uh, you know, you made some mistakes with in your relationship. Well, you can do the same thing. You can go there and apologize. You can use this back, back channel, if you like, conscious to consciousness to mend uh, problems to help somebody just feel better. Uh, you know, to mend old relationships, to do almost anything. It's a, it's a conscious to consciousness channel that is open and available to all of us. We'll get more effective with it as we practice. So, you know, you may have to practice this 10, 20, 30, 50 times, and then you'll start getting good at it. But it's not something you expect that, oh, I'm going to do this once for my first time and then I'm done and I expect a miracle, you know. It's not going to work like that. You're going to have to, to work at it for a while. And you'll see that as you get into it, you do end up in a meditation state. You don't have other thoughts because you're so engaged in what you're doing. You have 100% of your intention on what you're doing. If you're running this out of your intellect, my intellect has figured, okay, I'm going to be nice. My intellect says I'm going to talk to this person. I'm going to give them positive things. If it's all coming from your intellect, you're not going to be very effective. It has to come from your being level. It has to be a heart-to-heart -heart communication. It has to be authentic. It can't be an intellectual good idea to manipulate somebody to do something more positive or to think or be more positive. You can do it that way, but it's weak. The impact that it has is, is smaller if it comes out of your intellect. But if it comes out of your heart, out of your being, out of your sincerity, out of your authenticity, then it will have power. And you, again, you always have to check the results. So you go talk to these people or talk to people who talk to them and say, well, is grandma feeling any better now? And see, is she more relaxed? And other people will know. So you get some feedback of whether you're actually having an effect. Are you being helpful to grandma or not? Well, it may take you some weeks. It may take you a month. Depends on how frightened grandma is. How deep is that fear? The deeper that fear is, the longer it's going to take to try to work your way back out of that negative spiral. Um, so it's an interesting thing to do, but we all communicate telepathically with other people all the time. We're just not aware of it. And the same communication that we use to connect 
can be used to, under your theory and your from your experience, can be used to send them healing and love as well, as well sure. as communicating this positive um, Absolutely. information. You can send them healing, send them uh, feeling better, you know, better every day in every way. You know, you can give them, that's just a positive thing. Sure, you can send positiveness. And you can send positiveness to whole groups of people. All the people who are struggling trying to survive with, in, the, in the COVID uh, uh, issue we have, let's send some positive energy to all those people to lighten up and see the good things in life. And you can just send that out. It's not something that you can only do to one person. You can send it to groups of people. Well, in the groups of people, don't expect to have a strong an effect because now it's that energy you're putting into it spread over lots of people. You'll have a bigger effect on a single person, but you'll still have an effect. And the more people you get to do it, the more the effect will be. It's additive. So if you get yourself and your cousins and your, and your mother and father to all work on grandma, well, that'll have a bigger effect than if just you work on grandma. So there's lots of other variables that you can play with in this, in this process. But it's a simple thing and an easy thing for the average person to do and uh, keep it positive, keep it out of love, and it'll work. You know, be consistent and don't give up easily. Keep working on it. And if you'd like to see the results of this, um, you can join one of our global healing events, the outpouring. Mm -hmm. um, just notify Keith at MBT events and we can allow you to come into our global healing where a group of people gets together and does just this, send out loving and caring. Thank you very much, Tom. I know this is going to be helpful for everyone. Tom Campbell here. I and MBT events hope you liked this video. We now have well over a thousand hours of free video on this user-friendly ad-free YouTube channel. Though these videos are free to our viewers, they represent many thousands of hours in production and editing and many thousands of dollars invested in video and audio equipment along with the required computers and software to store and process the raw video into finished products. So far, all of this content has been funded directly out of our own pockets. Be assured, we will always continue to do what we can. It's our life, our purpose, a labor of love that we will continue to pursue as best we can. However, those pockets are not as deep as they used to be. Thus, we are now seeking to augment our resources with support from our viewers. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you.